Thank you. All right. Uh, Richie, you want to call the roll? I'll do that. I guess on the recording, can we just confirm that this thing um, called the virtual meeting preamble that um, Director Long, that you read that in its entirety? I confirm that I read the virtual meeting preamble in its entirety. All righty. So we'll go to the roll. Let's see, Director Long. Uh, present in the city of Charlottesville. Director Ray. Present in Albemarle County. Uh, Director Shreve. Present in Albemarle County. Uh, Director Munson. Present in beautiful downtown Scottsville. Um, Director Imhoff. Present in Albemarle County. Uh, Director McNaughton. Present, Troy, Virginia. And Director Matola. Present in Jose, Virginia. All right, Director Long, we have uh, um, everybody's present, so we have a quorum and can proceed. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. So uh, we will next will be matters from the public. Do we have anybody signed up to speak? No, sir, we do not. Okay. Anybody present wish to speak? Anybody raise their hand? All right, then we will proceed. So on to approval of the minutes. Um, I only had one thing I noticed in the minutes. In the discussion regarding the, on page three, in, at the very end of the discussion about the Broadway corridor, there's a paragraph that says, Mr. Munson shared that Scottsville is vexing over a similar situation. And I was not sure what vexing, I, I mean, this, they might be vexed, I guess. I don't know if that's what he said or not, but. <laughs> that, was, that was more of a creative license moment. <laughs> I like it actually, it's I, very descriptive of what I was doing. I can, I can strike the comment if required. <laughs> They talk differently in Scottsville. <laughs> <laughs> we use I'm not sure what, uh, what was intended to be said there, but uh, considering maybe? Considering, I will change it to considering. I'll note that change. All right. Were there any other comments to the minutes? Mr. Long, I'll move approval. All right. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. The minutes are approved. Um, financial report is a, the financial report is the same. There hasn't been a change. Uh, Dave, is there anything else you want to add, or anybody have any questions? No, unless you'd like me to just re reiterate the cash position so that we're all reminded and and what we have outstanding. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, net revenues for the year seventy thousand seven hundred forty three thirty four cents. Cash position. Current balance of eight hundred thirty-one thousand seven sixty-eight oh one, and uh, we have one hundred nine thousand uh, potentially to be spent on incentives that we've um, already underwritten. Although in one case, um, with Castle Gaming, seventeen thousand out of the twenty-one two, uh, that uh, my understanding is that agreement has expired and so we're still negotiating whether that's going to be extended or not that is correct all right any questions or comments thank you dave mm -hmm. uh so on to new business uh director's report i understand jt you're going to be handling that today well um uh, unless uh roger i see you're Oh, you've right. you've joined us. Um, is there? No, sir. I'm afraid I'm going to be coughing all over the place. Please proceed. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Chair Long. Uh, the director's report today is is just a brief one, a simple announcement to invite all the directors and um, your closest friends to an upcoming uh, event at North Fork for the Defense Intelligence Committee. This is um, a panel that will be moderated by um, the, the director, Roger Johnson, and include a number of folks who um, will 
share with the community the impact of the uh, defense sector on our community and lunch will be provided and um, you can register. I think the easiest way to register for lunch is through the Chamber of Commerce um, calendar page. So if you go to the Regional Chamber of Commerce page, go to their calendar, click on this event, April 28th, um, you'll be able to sign up for what type of lunch um, you would like to have. So uh, just a short and sweet director's report today. I'm, I'm also happy to help facilitate any registrations if any directors need assistance. So um, sort of following on that uh, related to the fact that this uh, luncheon is going to be out at the UVA Business Park, uh, I just wanted to make a quick report or mention of the fact that we had a meeting with uh, the UVA Foundation, it was Roger, JT, uh, Doug, and myself. Uh, we had a really good discussion. We'll, we'll, we can share more details later, so I know Roger has some thoughts, um, but I just wanted to mention that, that we had a discussion. I thought it was good. We sort of shared thoughts about goals and intents for, for both groups, and I think helped understand sort of the, what each each group has in mind and where we can work together and I think set the stage for having some good discussions with them down the road. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that, but that's just sort of a to let everybody know that happened last week. Um, all right, hearing none, we'll move on to the draft building reuse grant. JT. All right. So my screen seems to have frozen here all right I'm back on track so um distributed with the materials for today's meeting was a draft policy for our building reuse grant and i thought i would begin this item by just providing a little bit of breadcrumbs from when this topic was last discussed which was at the joint board eda meeting uh, back late last year we shared that a consistent problem that uh, the office was observing in the community were companies that were um, delaying or reducing their investment or contemplating leaving the county because they were having difficulty finding space for their expanding business. And so we proposed an idea of, of a building reuse grant that could be used for businesses that were consistent with Project Enable um, within a target industry, a primary business, which as a reminder is one that generates more than 50% of its revenue from outside of the area. And we just talked about some very uh, general guidelines, um, what types of spaces might be appropriate for this type of grant and uh, what type of costs and at, and at what rate um, would we want to um, participate or, or subsidize or provide a grant to, to help businesses use that space? So we looked at an example that was a, a company, this is just a, a, a fictional example, but it's, it's rooted in conversations that our office has had with um, businesses looking across the region um, that was looking for 10,000 square feet, found a, a place in, in Albemarle County at $17 a square foot, but would require $100,000 of investment before the business could move in and, and be operational. And then um, adjacent counties, counties B and C, where the rent was much lower and the, the space was ready to be occupied um, and put to use by the company. So in this example, uh, we were seeking feedback on whether or not uh, up to $50,000 reimbursement for capital costs associated with the building would be appropriate. And from that general discussion, we've built out a, a policy that we're seeking your feedback on. And we have some questions. I'd, I'd like to go directly to the primary document to go through it so the 
directors can see the language and um, provide any feedback on what's included in it. And then we'll come back to these questions. What we're gonna do with the director's feedback, this will inform uh, a consent agenda item that goes before the Board of Supervisors in late May. And then we'll come back to the EDA for formal adoption or for further work um, after that. So I'm going to exit the PowerPoint and go to the, the primary, um, the document that was distributed with today's meeting materials. And I won't, I won't read all three pages, but there are just a few items I wanted to highlight um, before getting to the director's feedback. So much like our other uh, grant policies, the, this policy begins with an overview of our mission and uh, of the office and um, that our work is governed by our strategic plan, Project Enable. Um, it talks about some of the other county policies that this policy would support. And that includes things like the Climate Action Plan. One of the things that we didn't talk about um, when we discussed it in October was the county's new core value of community, which expects diversity, equity, and inclusion to be integrated in how we live our mission. So one of the factors that could be considered for a building reuse grant would be, is the business that's being served under, under resourced? Um, uh, and we have historically defined that as businesses that are owned and operated um, or owned by women, minority or veterans, um, which data has shown consistently these businesses face uh, significant barriers to access and capital. So the policy goes further from there to say that the grants would range between 25 and $250,000, um, that the, um, this would be subject to budget resources because currently economic development doesn't have um, a, a dedicated revenue source. So we're dependent on um, things like positive year-end variance or um, federal monies or other uh, revenue sources. And so to prioritize how these grants would work, um, we would first look to existing county businesses that are growing and expanding and at risk for leaving. Uh, there would be two types of entities that would be eligible, property owners and businesses. And so a, a property owner that had a commercially or industrially zoned space within the development area um, that was renovating the space for a business um, subject to these criteria below would, would be eligible for the grant. And those types of businesses would be um, in good financial standing with the county, consistent with Project Enable, um, and signing a lease to be in that space for at least two <clears throat> years. The, the costs would be um, shown in the bullets, these four bullets right here. Um, water, sewer, or power extensions or expansions, um, site work that's uh, necessary to establish those uh, capital investments. Um, and, and there would also be uh, eligibility for internet connectivity, recognizing that that's such a critical part of, of businesses in today's uh, economy. Things that would be ineligible would be fixtures, furniture, and equipment, um, landscaping, proffered improvements that um, may have been uh, proffered during a, a rezoning process, and, and just generally anything that could be easily removed from the property. There are very few um, zoned or designated properties that are currently um, of significant historic resources, but if, if there was a business seeking to use a building like that. For example, um, we had the Potter's Craft move into Neve Hall down Route 29. There's an expectation that the 
that the character defining features would be maintained through the use of this grant. Um, other factors that the EDA could, could consider when a, when a grant came forward would be a statement by the company about the critical role of a grant like this in working with other businesses um, who are looking at Albemarle as well as like the example showed counties B and C. Um, we've heard how, um, how much something like this could make a difference in deciding between moving to somewhere else in the region or being able to grow here in Albemarle County. Um, the EDA could consider other factors like, did the business receive other state grants? Um, you could also consider whether or not the, uh, the grant could catalyze other business activity adjacent to um, where the business is, is making these renovations. To determine a specific amount of grant, uh, this criteria here mirrors a lot of the existing um, adopted policy that we have for our Commonwealth Opportunity Fund or our Virginia Job Investment Program. Um, would, would the uh, improvement contribute to the community character or a public good? Um, does it grow the tax base? Uh, to what degree are the jobs of uh, um, significant wages and, and benefits um, offered to those jobs? Basically, are they career ladder jobs? Um, does it achieve a specific goal outlined by uh, a specific county policy and any other factor by the EDA, uh, determined by the EDA? So we would envision that a business or a property owner would make an application according to our meeting de uh, deadlines, and they would answer a, a few of these questions in addition to uh, providing evidence of the other criteria listed above. You know, what would the um, grant be used for and um, an intention to sign a lease of at least two years. Um, and the budget would be determined annually, again, because we don't have a dedicated funding source. And even though the grant would be performance-based, uh, we're still recommending a performance agreement. This would protect the county against a situation like a business that um, gets started, but then um, for some reason decides to move away. Uh, a performance agreement would reserve the right for the county to uh, uh, try to, to claw back any, any funds that, that may be possible. So just wanted to hit the highlights there of, of that particular, of, of the proposed grant, and then come back to the PowerPoint where we have specific questions. Um, and then also wanna hear any feedback that EDA directors may have so um, maybe I'll just start with, are there any general questions? I've, I've got one for you. Um, why two years? I mean, if it's, you know, 200 for the grand, it would seem like uh, a little bit longer term commitment, especially if they want to stay in the county. <laughs> I mean, you don't want yeah. to make it unbearable, but two years doesn't seem that long to me. That's a, that's a great point, Director McDonald, and, and exactly the kind of feedback we want. Um, some of the feedback in providing the draft policy to, to other economic development offices, as well as other internal offices was that the uh, criteria was too limiting and they didn't feel like anybody would be able to meet it. So this was an attempt to, to establish a minimum of two years, but um, certainly that could be a, a factor in determining the amount of grant. Um, or you may have a suggestion about what a, an alternative minimum should be. Director? Yes, Director. George. Yes, Director Ray. In, in uh, my experience, tenants always want a one-year lease. As a landlord, I typically want a five-year lease. Uh, ordinarily, we'll compromise on a three-year lease. Uh, and I think you guys ought to give some thought to making that a three-year minimum. Okay. 
kind of a related question. And thank you, Steve, for that comment. I, I felt the same way. The other thing is what happens, uh, whatever the duration of the, of the lease term is, what happens after that term uh, expires and then the tenant moves out and moves away? Yeah, our goal would be to only fund improvements that would be generally um, useful to a commercial or industrial user. So those capital improvements should remain. There shouldn't be anything that has been funded by the grant that would not improve the space or otherwise make it ready for another business to move in and become operational. Does that new business in that example, does that new business also have to meet these guidelines? Uh, we have not contemplated that, but um, we can note that feedback. I mean, I think if the if the original one has satisfied the requirements, I don't know why the, the sort of follow on one would would need to do that. Uh, now, maybe if they left beforehand, they'd have to find somebody to sort of step into their shoes. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a little fuzzy because um, if, if in an extreme example, you fund $250,000 in capital improvements for a tenant who's going to stay there two years, and after the two-year period, that tenant goes away and maybe even goes out of this area, then you've improved the landlord's, uh, the, the owner's property by a quarter of a million dollars. And uh, that seems to me to be a pretty darn good boon for uh, commercial property owners. Yeah, it's a, a great observation, Director Ray. I, I think that one of the things that, one of the minimum criteria is that the space prior to the initial tenant um, coming in will have been vacant for six months or more. And um, my overall experience in, in the county for spaces that have been vacant for that long, um, you know, generally the, a, a grant of that amount would um, hopefully make it so that we don't continue to have vacant space for for that period of time. Um, but certainly if, if, um, if you, I could, I could note the feedback of considering a reduction in the, in the overall maximum, or um, we could alternatively uh, extend the, the minimum lease period. Well, I think it comes back to the, the question of sort of what, you know, of balancing those um, where you, you know, if it's, if it's $25,000, maybe two years is fine, but if it's $250,000, then you have to, to look at it long-term and you maybe have to think about whether there are other conditions you need to, to attach to it to, to make sure that, you know, it's not a windfall for somebody. Dave, you had a, your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> related to all of what we've what you've just uh, discussed, um, I wanted to start by asking George um, if he had any experience with a situation in which a tenant uh, made substantial capital improvements, and did you make any concessions in your leases uh, with with uh, that kind of a tenant? Uh, Dave, we handle that on a case by case basis. Uh, it, in order to secure a quality tenant, we will frequently, frequently make a contribution to things like their fit out. Um, okay. Normally for sort of a run of the mill business, we don't do that. So well, certainly for a I guess, reason, like, I guess I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle. So if a, if a tenant came with the intent of making capital improvements, whether they got it from us or they had it in their own pocket, um, and they said, you know, look, we'll rent this space from you at, at, for X dollars per square foot, um, and we plan on making these kind of improvements, which will, 
you know, accrue to your, your benefit in the long run, do you make a concession on the lease rate or anything of that sort or what, uh, or, or have you had any experience with that at all? Uh, I think we probably would, I mean, if it was, if it was a situation where those improvements were something that ordinarily had to be done, uh, regardless of the business, then we certainly would give them a break on the rent. Okay. If it was something that was specific to that business, then we would not. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that because maybe the leverage we bring here and it, and it uh, connects back to the term, whether it's two years or or a, maybe a sliding scale, as Don seemed to suggest. If it's a smaller amount, it's a shorter term. A larger amount would imply a, a longer term. But we might also couple that with some kind of a um, a kind of a lock-in guarantee uh, on on the lease rate, because it strikes me that you know, going back to the hypothetical example that JT introduced, that one of the problems we may be facing here is that we have higher lease rates within our county boundaries than they might find elsewhere. And this is part of an incentive to keep them there here uh, with higher rates. So the last thing we really want to do is have a, uh, introduce a windfall for a uh, property owner that is likely to help them increase their rates in the near future. Um, so uh, if you combine perhaps a longer term with that kind of a guarantee, maybe that secures a, the kind of guarantee we're looking for and, and public value on both ends. That is, the tenant's going to stay. And also, you're likely to improve a capital uh, asset without uh, encouraging higher lease rates. I think those are two great points. And uh, uh, the, the suggestion that Chairman Long made uh, of the sliding scale, which you've kind of endorsed, I think that makes a great deal of sense. Yeah. So if it's 100,000, it might be a three-year lease. If it's 200,000, it might be a five-year lease or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely concur. I mean, what is that, 50 grand a year, George? So if you had a five-year lease, that's 250. Uh, and then it slides on down from there. And it, and it won't make up the difference uh, in, in the hypothetical example, for example, between you know, even a medium term uh, <clears throat> difference in lease rates, um, it'll just help. Uh, so the, the, the tenant has, has got to find our community attractive for other reasons as well. And I think we stand in such a position where we don't have to worry about that too much. We are an attractive community. People wanna be here for the talented workforce and so on and so forth. So I don't think we have to bend over backwards to. Uh, to make up the, the complete difference here in what they're likely to see between us and some other remote location. Um, but a little bit might help. Yeah, I think the one thing I'm thinking about, uh, and I welcome any other comments is we do have, um, well, we have had issues with properties that are sitting and have been sitting vacant for a long time. And while I don't want to encourage sort of windfalls for landlords who, who won't do what they need to or have the ability to do, at the same time, encouraging properties to get fixed up and get people in them and, and having functional businesses in those properties, there is some benefit to the county for, for having that, even if it's is the slight windfall for somebody. And I think that just needs to be part of the evaluation in the process. Well, it, it may also, Don, give us more um, ability and latitude with which to impose a kind of a um, lease freeze requirement of some sort, whether, right. we, whether we inflate it you know, to be fair or whatever we consider to be fair, that we have some kind of a requirement there. Because again, you're looking at a situation where it's likely to be something rather than nothing. <laughs> right. And, right. I, and, I, and I think uh, that's that's a pretty good deal. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, and, and I know Kat's uh, got her hand up. I guess the uh, the other piece that I, I mean, I think that, that Roger often cites is the, the sort of but-for requirement of, you know, or, or 
what we want to be doing is doing things that allow things to happen that might not happen if we weren't present, which I think is what you're saying, you know, Dave, is yeah. we need to step in in a situation where if, if we, we can't provide some help, uh, it, it might not happen, but we also need to protect and say, if we are providing this help and good things happen, then we shouldn't, there shouldn't be a windfall for somebody. And, and not so, you know, the windfall is one thing. And I, you know, we shouldn't be all that jealous uh, so that, uh, you know, we uh, <laughs> want to stop all windfall gains. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes those are good for the community too. Right. But, but more than, than a windfall problem is the problem of exacerbating another problem. And that is high lease rates for gotcha. commercial, yeah, commercial enterprises who are looking in vain for a, an affordable place. No, that's a good point. Pat? Um, I, I wanted to say the thing that appealed to me about this is the use of existing buildings. And I'm, I'm increasingly looking at everything with a climate change lens. And, you know, one of the best things you can do is try to re reuse, refurbish, reinvest. I wondered um, if there are any thoughts of maybe creating some priority areas. And I, I bring this up for Director Munson to comment on, but one of the things I've, I've heard about Scottsville is that there is somewhat of a situation where there's a couple of, of people who own many of the buildings and don't live in the area and frankly haven't been that amenable to renting them out or doing much with them. They're kind of sitting on them as long-term you know, real estate investments. You know, I'm wondering if this is the kind of project or grant program if we tried to target some of the areas where we know we've got sort of long-standing um, underused or non-occupied structures. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, we do have quite a few absentee uh, landlords here that are holding onto their buildings um, and asking rents that most businesses find um, exorbitant and can really ruin a business plan. Um, so I think if, if uh, we can, anything that we can do to encourage those owners to um, maintain those buildings or, or get them into a, uh, a state where uh, they can be um, affordable um, and used, I think that might, that, that would be really helpful to, to us. Stuart, do many of those uh, property owners have property in far-flung places out of state, or are they just other other towns nearby? They a lot of them live in other countries. Okay, all right. Back. So they're just you know, and this is it's something that that uh, you know they've got a fair amount of money and and a fair amount of other properties, um, and this is just very low on their radar screen. So it's, well, I, I asked that because one of the really weird phenomena that has emerged in the last few decades is where um, owners of vacant commercial properties who whom you think would, would want some rent rather than mm -hmm. zero yeah. uh, are happy not to take any rent because in some ways it plays back into their ability to borrow money at a, on better terms. If they can hmm. speak to, you know, common lease rates that are higher than common lease rates that are lower. Um, and so it's a bit of a game. I, I, it's one that I don't think you can play for, for very long uh, before people start to, you know, the CPAs ask questions, but uh, nonetheless, I, I wonder if that's happening where you are. It may well, I really don't know, to be honest with you. This is kind of the first I've heard of that. It's common in New York. Really? Huh. There's a lot of, yeah. lot of vacant storefronts and People always scratch their heads and say, "Why? Why won't they take yeah. some rent?" And they're they're not dropping their their lease rates as a result, yep. even though even though the vacancies are quite numerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we do have a situation where um, Tiger Fuel has bought the um, the shopping center up by the uh, um, uh, by the food line. And they are putting in a, um, a new uh, deli and, and uh, gas station right on the corner there, at the top of the hill, six and, and 20. Um, and so there, there is, I, I think their expectation is the increased traffic is gonna <clears throat> increase the value of, 
of the storefronts in the uh, in the shopping center, because most of those at this point are you know, at least half of them are, are vacant. Um, and we have, we've had several businesses that have made inquiries in there and just found the rents to be too high. And uh, Tiger Fuel is just not able, not willing to negotiate on yeah. that. So I don't think this is the case of what you were, this is different from what you were talking about, but it is a, a situation where, um, where they might uh, be more amenable to um, renting to a business if some of the internal, of uh, certainly the costs of, 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 of doing, of, of the build out are, are facilitated by a grant that might, might bridge the gap between what the, the business would be able to pay and, and uh, uh, or at least take the money that they had set aside for, for build out and put that toward rent, for example, and make that a feasible business space. Stuart, this is Diane, but what you describe is really interesting. I had no idea that that was happening in the Scottsville area where people were, you know, we all know that we have folks from other countries that swoop in and buy up large farms and properties mm -hmm. in Almar County. Certainly I have a number of them in the Jack Jewett district and they live here a, a month or two or three months or whatever it might be, but they really are not part of the community and don't live here. They're using, you know, us as a way to, you know, you could say shield their money or buy property or whatever it might be. I don't, it, the cases may be different. And I've certainly have been following in the in New York and Washington how we have folks from out of the country buying up commercial properties and then just letting them go fallow and sitting mm -hmm. empty. And that is a huge problem in neighborhoods right now. But I didn't realize, I guess naively, that we have that happening in beautiful downtown Scottsville. <laughs> uh, that's so, a little, you know, we are concerning. an international center, so. Well, it's very <laughs> concerning. I mean, it, that really is concerning. Yes, mm -hmm. Mr. Lukashenko, we'd love to. Have some of <laughs> JT? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just um, gonna comment based on the, the discussion happening. I think it, um, it all speaks to question number two. Um, the purpose of the grant is to support for-profit businesses. And if it would um, address all of the concerns that have been raised to just eliminate a, an individual property owner from being an applicant, that we could uh, maintain the, the example here where if only businesses were eligible, they could approach us with proposed lease terms from a property owner um, and only businesses could be eligible. But it, it felt like um, a lot of the discussion really spoke to question number two. So I thought I could yeah, transition us there and see if that. That's a good idea. The other thing uh, that might be worth considering um, folks is that, um, Bullet point number three, is this criteria too restrictive? Uh, uh, not just with the, uh, whether it goes for property owners or tenants, but also whether primary business is too restrictive. And I think sometimes that is an overrated category because part of the implicit assumption there, which I think is, you know, kind of blind to reality is that uh, the, the reason a primary business would be more attractive is because they're bringing in revenue from uh, not from pockets of Albemarle County or Charlottesville residents. But again, the, the, the assumption there is that if, if it's not a primary business and Albemarle County residents and Charlottesville residents are spending prominently in such a business, that they're somehow not getting value for their dollars spent, <laughs> that they're throwing it away. So, um, you know, because the 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 only proposition in that equation that should really matter to us as a public entity or quasi public entity is would be the tax revenue implication, which should be close to neutral either way. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know. I think I, I think maybe that's that might be too restrictive as well, and it might also stand in the way of fulfilling the the one aim that that you cited earlier, JT, for um, approaching minority or women-owned businesses, you know, of great need. 
um, uh, because I think, you know, when you when you move into this category, you might still find some women and minority owned businesses, but they're usually not the ones in great need um, compared to some of the others. Yeah. Um, I, I want to uh, agree with what you just said, um, Dave, and and also while it won't fit this category, um, I often worry about businesses that we're not thinking about that need support. Um, I've been in a lot of conversations recently. There is no um, kill facility that's even close by. We have a talk to some folks who've started reinvesting in agriculture and have a you know sheep operation just started and I was going, well, where's your abattoir? Where, how are you gonna do that? And that's come up a lot of times as we begin to think more about um, keeping food, local food local. So while this wouldn't fit that, I'd love at some point to think about what are those pieces of the puzzle in the agricultural community that we could support, maybe not with these funds, but that is a facility that we, are, we do not have in Albemarle County. Yeah, I, JT, in response to your question about whether a um, property owner could apply, I guess I would want to keep that as, a, as an option just because, you know, it might be, you know, in some ways the economics are the same regardless of, of, of how it, you sort of slice it up. Um, and, you know, you may, it may be a situation where a business owner or a property owner comes and said, look, I've got a tenant and, you know, I can only do this in my situation, they can't afford to do something else, you know, can you fill this gap so that we can do what we need to do? And then, you know, I could potentially give them a rent break or whatever over that. that, that and you break. think, Don, that the property owner in that hypothetical situation might be in a better position than the tenant to undertake the change? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I think they may where they may know what needs to happen. I, I mean, I sort of feel like we almost have to put this program out there and see who shows up looking for it. I mean, we obviously need some, some framework for people to work on, but until we see what people are gonna come up with, as long as we've got some flexibility to decide whether or not yeah. we wanna do it, I think the- Yeah, and, and what you could do perhaps is, is leave that category in uh, as as an eligible partner, uh, but then put stricter terms on on that end. Right. So so that maybe we again we put some kind of a lease freeze guarantee subject to you know an inflation factor or something to be fair, and and maybe even take a page out of Henry George's playbook from 1876, in which George proposed in New York City a a single tax for um, improvements. Uh, capital improvements and capital gains, I should say, uh, where say a business like this received public funds, improved their asset, and then sold it and pocketed the difference. Uh, George proposed that that be taxed at 100% and, and siphoned back to the community. Um, you know, we could even put some, some version of a Georgist uh, uh, property tax on this um, just to protect ourselves. Um, so as to not make a property owner ineligible if, as Don says, you know, that was the need, that it's clear that that that, that property owner was the only one in the position to make the change. Uh, you would you would want to discount that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, my perception is from a process standpoint, you know, if we create create this program, people would apply and then you know, we'd evaluate it and say, you know here's what they want to do and here's what we're willing to do under these conditions. And we could sort of balance those things and, and, and see what those needs are and evaluate the, the, uh, the situation. And, you know, obviously we require the financials and we know what's going on. I think, I think we, we're just going to have to look at it on a case by case basis. Yeah. I'm happy uh, to sort of put the program out there and, you know, we can always say no, uh, and see what sort of issues come up. Uh, I, I, I would like to see a sliding scale done, as you've suggested, on the, on the lease term based on the amount of the grant. Uh, and I'm also curious what people think about the assets of the owner, the property owner. Uh, does that make any difference? That might address some of the 
some of the comments that were made about, you know, folks from the Far East buying farms in Apple, Alamore County. I mean, I think that's relevant to to what you're doing or to, to the decision you make if you know if it's a if they're making a decision to not do that when they've got the capacity to do it, that would that would factor into the decision making, it seems to me. Um, now maybe you could argue that uh, they would say, well, but this business, you know, we're not willing to make that investment because our return's not going to get us where we need to, and and that you know regardless of how much money we're not going to invest more. So I think that would just be the analysis that we need to do when you're looking at the at the transaction. That sounds like the argument of the state farm building owners. <laughs> well, I think I think it, I think the idea is a great idea to recycle buildings and for us to encourage people to do that. Uh, and I, and I don't want to, you know, handicap the process by having too many rules and regulations. Right. Um, Chair Long, I, I think just to, to sum up, I, I think for the application process itself, we should be directing applicants to, to illustrate and highlight the gap that the county's participation would be filling. Is that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. accurate? Gotcha. Um, I think we've got great feedback on one, two, and possibly three. I'll just quickly note um, for um, members of the public that may be on the call and, and directors that may have not been with us when Project Enable was established, the reason that primary businesses were favored over um, consumptive businesses, um, those being local businesses that help circulate the dollar around was that the, the, the goal was for our office in the, in the, in the uh, targeted role that we would play in the ecosystem of economic development partners was to focus on the primary businesses that were importing new money into our community and growing the pie that's circulated around by the consumptive businesses. Um, that was the thinking of it. Uh, certainly not to um, certainly not to uh, not give credit to all of the consumptive businesses, the more than ninety five percent of businesses in our community that are considered consumptive in terms of just serving our our local metropolitan statistical area. Um, but, can I just uh, make sure that I've got the EDA's feedback on question number three, whether or not um, it's too restrictive? I, I think there's been the a, a point made that that will undermine our goal of under-resourced and underserved entrepreneurs. Um, but was there any other feedback for for number three? Well, uh, you know, I could add uh, to your concern, JT, which is you know uh, a really smart one. Um, you know, the, the multiplier that we get here is, is significant, whether it's high or low and, and how it redounds to the benefit of all citizens. Um, but that's partly dependent on the way in which the business operates too. And, and whether, you know, uh, looking at the career ladder jobs uh, network is an important factor, but not the only one. Um, because if it's lopsided and you've got, you know, a dozen of those at the top, and then they're hiring minimum wage workers at the bottom. Uh, it's a it's a different kind of a multiplier. Uh, presumably, a business that would be local and consumptive that would seek this kind of assistance is is going to have a pretty terrific multiplier for folks who are already living here, who may be underemployed. Um, you know, and who stand to gain pretty demonstrably by this, particularly if we're not cutting out, you know, women and minority owned businesses in the process. So, um, so I wouldn't discount that. I, I think, again, uh, it's understandable why you would target primary businesses for the, that simple revenue effect, but it's not, not always that simple. And I think we ought to consider that. I, I think maybe the way to, to treat it is, is 
as a factor to be evaluated, sort of like the, yeah. you know, the, the equitable considerations is, you know, this is one of the things that we, we consider and obviously we want to encourage primary businesses, but there may be other factors that make a different business a better choice for this particular. Yeah, in the same manner that we, you know, we see an applicant, a property owner applicant, and it's traced to a uh, company uh, <clears throat> based in the Seychelles or the Isle of Man <laughs> or the British Virgin Islands, then we know it's a automatic red flag. <laughs> so, um. all right, anything Thank else? Thank you for that you? feedback. No, unless um, I do want to give an opportunity to recognize um, Roger Johnson or, or Doug Walker or um, any of the other county executives that may be with us that would like to see clarity on any. JT, I have nothing of substance to add. Thank you so much. Thanks, JT. Okay. All right. All right. Well, um, just to, to wrap up the discussion, thank you to all the directors that provided this excellent feedback. We'll, we'll make these changes. Um, and then over the next week, we'll, we'll begin to prepare the materials for the board meeting um, that will take place on May 18th. Uh, unfortunately, that is one day after our EDA's next meeting. So um, it will be coming back um, to the EDA on June 21st for final adoption. Thanks everybody for that. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, so now we are going to go into closed session. Uh, I will read the closed session motion. Oh, there we go. Uh, I move that the Albemarle County Economic Development Authority go into a closed meeting as authorized by the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, section 2.2, 3711A of the Code of Virginia under subsection six to discuss and consider the investment of public funds for the development of the Lewis and Clark Exploratory Center at Dardentau Park, where bargaining is involved and where if made public initially would adversely affect the financial interest of the county. And subsection eight to discuss and consider consultation with the EDA legal counsel regarding the Lewis and Clark Exploratory Center loan which would require legal counsel's advice and if provided an open section would adversely affect the EDA's negotiating posture. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So uh, we don't need a roll call vote on that, do we, Richie? Yeah. No. Okay. So now we need to uh, leave this meeting and move to the team's meeting for the closed session. That's right. Okay. See everybody over there. Okay. Uh, how do I get there, remind me? It's not in the chat. It used to be in the chat, wasn't it? Yeah, Director Munson, um, in your email, there'll be a, a link to join a team's meeting. Okay, is that one that just just you just posted, or is it from at three? Yes, at three thirty right. this afternoon, we sent the closed meeting link. Okay, and then we'll we'll rejoin this meeting after okay. this. Thank you, sir. Yeah.
I guess, do we have everybody? I think we do. Looks like it. All right. Um, so let me see here. Is um is anyone else having trouble hearing Chair Long? Everybody Maybe else my, okay? Hold on. Am I too okay. quiet or? He sounds right. good now. There was an echo on the Teams call, but he's good now. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I move that the EDA certified by recorded vote that the, to the best of each director's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion authorizing the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting. All right, I'll do the roll call. Director yep. Long? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Shreve? Aye. Let's see, Director Munson. Aye. Uh, Director Imhoff. Aye. Director McNaughton. Aye. And Director Matola. Aye. That's unanimous. The motion passes. All right. Thank you. Um, so, other matters. Um, the only other matter that I'm aware of is that. Mr. Munson has announced his intent to resign from the EDA. Um, I have considered that and have decided that I am not going to accept his resignation. So he's <laughs> going to have to continue on the board for an indefinite period of time. So I'm, I'm sorry that we're not in a position to do that. We want to make sure that we hear from lovely Scottsville uh, periodically. So mm -hmm. sorry about that. Um, Thank you for you know, that. <laughs> we, uh, we certainly understand. Uh, we appreciate what you have done and you know, the contributions you have made. And I hope you can find, or I should say that Supervisor Price can find someone as able to ably represent Scottsville in the magisterial district as you have. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for what you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Stuart, I understand you. you're going to be traveling. Maybe you can send us a couple of pictures that we can. <laughs> sure. Actually, um, I'm going to have, I've got an Instagram account and, uh, and I'm going to be posting pictures as I drive across country and then paddle around Nova Scotia or around British Columbia. So oh. if you're interested, you can just search me on that and, and you'll get updates real time by, by pictures. You say paddling, Stuart? Yeah, I'm going to go on a, uh, I'm going to take a month to drive out to uh, British Columbia and then July and August I'll be uh, paddling on, on the in, uh, inside passage. Oh, wow. Between British Columbia and, and uh, Alaska. So while, I, while you're doing that, I'll be bringing some adaptive uh, paddling students down to the James River. Not far from you. So. All right, fantastic. You all I, was out, uh, I was out there on Sunday. It was beautiful. Yeah. Well, your your students will be less likely to get eaten by killer whales than Stewart. <laughs> yeah, Hardware River doesn't have any of those. You know? Right. Some like salmon, some like bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. Um, anything else? 
Can I raise one matter in terms of um, <clears throat> electronic meetings that are um, coming down the road? Okay. And, and I, I just want to plant a seed because the General Assembly has passed a bill um, permitting certain public bodies to conduct uh, uh, virtual meetings on, uh, on less than a regular basis. Um, I, I do note that the EDA does not have a written policy for even for the members to have electronic participation such that if, if you were out on personal business or medical reasons, um, we, we don't have provisions for electronic participation during normal times. Um, and these aren't normal times, but they're going to come to an end, as I understand it, in June. So what I want the board, uh, what I want the board to think about is um, one is whether it wants to adopt uh, an electronic participation policy, which will allow members, if they're traveling in Nova Scotia, um, to <laughs> dial in and to participate in the meeting. Um, I know Don goes out west, so sometimes um, that. It, that, that policy would allow him to um, participate if he were out west. Separate policy is whether we want to, um, to adopt, a, a, adopt standards for conducting all virtual meetings. Um, those are extremely limited in their applicability. Um, I don't know how practical it is to do that, but that's just, I wanna plant that seed and we'll have to have that discussion um, going forward. And Rich, I really thank you for bringing that up because uh, just so everybody is aware, the Board of Supervisors did adopt, um, at, you know, uh, uh, the ability, we have the now policy that we can, members can zoom in if they're out of town or if they have a medical reason. Um, there are limitations. And I think, Rich, the Planning Commission is planning on doing the same thing, hmm. is my understanding. So... Um, yeah, and, and that's a, that's a pretty easy lift. The tougher lift is going to be determining mm -hmm. under what circumstances um, this body can meet all virtually. And the law does require that um, we identify those circumstances. And mm -hmm. um, so some thoughts are, I, mean, I don't know if they can be scheduled around um, Christmas or other, other times. Um, a thought that crossed my mind is, um, you know, special meetings that, uh, th that the policy could provide for all virtual meetings if, if an emergency came up or some special issue came up. Um, it's tough to plan those because you can't, you, can't have, you can't have two meetings that are all virtual. They can't be back to back. Um, so if you have an all virtual meeting, then the next meeting has to be in person. Um, so it, it just logistically, it's difficult, but it is out there. And so I, I just want you all to start thinking about that. It doesn't come into effect until September 1st. So we have a couple meetings. What kind of capacity does the county have if let's just say one or two of us were <clears throat> to take advantage of that um, chiming in from somewhere else? Um, would, would you have like a projection screen and an audio system so that everybody wouldn't have to have you know, some kind of a, a, a laptop connection still in person uh, in, in, in the room or? Um, yeah. So for, per, oh, go ahead, Doug. I was gonna say for the personal, if, if it's just a personal electronic participation, my understanding is the capacity's pretty good, um, whether it would just be telephonic or whether it would be by Zoom. Um, this body would be scheduled to meet in room 241, which is, Right. Um, it, which is IT has set that up to do electronic meetings. Um, and, and I understand it can do an all virtual meeting also. So I, I think we're, we have capacity for that, but I'll defer to Doug on that. No, you're, you're right. All virtual, all in person are the easiest, the hybrid, so it's difficult. But if, if the member is just, is the one who, that's participating electronically, you're not trying to then conduct a hybrid meeting to pull the public in virtually also, it becomes uh, measurably easier. Um, we're gonna have to work through this in all kinds of, uh, of instances, but um, we, we got a plan. Also wanted to clarify that, <clears throat> that return to in-person meetings for group two, um, that's, the, that's the ticket that you're holding as an EDA, <laughs> uh, is no sooner than June. The board's gonna have this conversation in May. Um, and then depending on when the, you know, if they, if they make the decision then, um, depending on when the bodies that are in group two meet and what the notice requirements are, it may be June, it may be July. Um, but that conversation is coming up. So I just wanted just to, just to add that, uh, that caveat in there. And Richie, I think uh, for purposes of clarity, you're talking about either having virtual meetings or in-person meetings, but not having hybrid meetings, correct? Or are you suggesting we have hybrid meetings? Well, I, I so it, it's, Hybrid's a bit of a misnomer. And right. a hybrid is an in-person meeting, 
that allows the public to participate um, electronically. So that, that's more of a IT logistical type thing. It's not a legal issue. Um, so, uh, so we either have all virtual meetings or we have in-person meetings. Um, and, and, and if one or two members are um, out of town for personal reasons or medical reasons, then they can be brought in, but that, that doesn't create a virtual meeting. That's still an in, we still have to have a quorum in person and we can just accommodate um, those types of things. So they're actually two separate categories. I, it is confusing, but they're two separate categories. Thank you for that. And I will say, and I, Doug, I ask that you correct me if I misspeak here, but hybrid meetings require additional staff support that go beyond uh, the normal. So having hybrid meetings could be problematic, not from the technical side, but also the resource sides for after hour meetings. So mm -hmm. that's a consideration as well. Right. Well, is, is the expectation that, that our in-person meetings are, are not hybrid meetings or just <laughs> in person or? I think the expect, well, I mean, that, that's, that's part of what the board's gonna need to discuss. Um, I think that the expectation for group two is that you have the ability to do hybrid meetings. And, and, and the, I think that Richie explained that very well, which is allowing the public to participate virtually, but having the members there uh, in person with the caveats that the new state legislation then kind of carves out for that. Um, so there's a, there's a relatively small group of, of, um, of um, uh, boards, commissions, authorities that would fit into that category. And that's, that's part of what the board will be discussing. Uh, in May. I mean, I, I certainly, to the extent we can do it, think it's good because it allows more people to participate and to, um, to listen in and, and to the extent it doesn't cause a, a strain on resources. If the facilities are there and we can do it, I think we should be doing that. I think we should, you know, have our, our policy in terms of meeting participation be as broad as the, the statute allows in terms of individuals missing the meeting because I think it is important to have people and it, it eliminates some of the quorum issues and you know if people are available well I guess it doesn't if you still got to have an in-person quorum but um, so I, I think we should we should do that in terms of you know when we want to have virtual meetings I guess we should just look and see what other you know what other folks are doing I do like the idea of you know being able to call a quick meeting to have for you know, special sessions for a one-time thing seems to be the bet, you know, a, a really good use of that. Um, Cause it's, you know, it's easier to get people together for 15 minutes by Zoom than it is to try to get everybody together for an in-person meeting. Unless it's in Scottsville down at the uh, James River Brewery. That's right, that's right. Great idea. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen that, it, that the format works effectively in a, and enables us to, to do what we need to get or get done what we need to get done. So I don't see any reason in, in you know, limiting its use if we have to. So, um, part of the, uh, the, I guess, the decision about um, allocating or designating the 241 for the EDA uh, is that is the room where the technology improvements have been made to allow the, um, the, the public to participate virtually. I'm trying to think of, I've got to come up with another word than hybrid, Richie. Right. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's uh, kind of pre-programmed to be available. Uh, and then, then what's we'll up to make the determination about, um, about the use of that technology for that purpose. I will say, and Diantha knows, is that the board has expressed uh, the same amount of enthusiasm, if not more, for uh, kind of continuing to take advantage of the, um, of the increased participation remotely from folks who you know, otherwise you know, aren't necessarily going to get up and, and, and drive to, uh, to Cobb McIntyre for a meeting. I don't, know why. I don't know why they wouldn't want to come to an EDA <laughs> meeting in person, but um, we, we could call it the beam them in Scotty provision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? Low hanging fruit is to go on and go after your all's ability if you're ill or traveling to be able to. Yeah. 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 So what I understand then is with this change in the state law, is Stewart is not resigning. Is that right? Is that, <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a conclusion. No coverage in British Columbia. Yeah, we're I'm, well, I'm sure it's there. You think so uh, far? You'll be showing us a potlash ceremony, right? <laughs> Indeed.
I was going to say so far, Don and I have chimed in and we both denied his request. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be here next month. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll negotiate with you on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks thank a lot, y'all. Stay healthy. Okay. Bye. Bye. Enjoy. See you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.